Hello. <clears throat> um, hey, everyone. So uh, thank you for um, attending this fireside chat that since this is hosting around uh, package versus composable approaches to CDP. Um, I'm your host and moderator, uh, David Chan um, from Deloitte Digital. And what we want to do today is really talk about um, this. Well, let's have a discussion around what we're calling this growing customer data divide between internal teams around IT and, and potentially marketing, uh, which is fueling some of this debate on the topic. Uh, it's really about having an open dialogue um, between the different CEOs who obviously play at the center of this space and get their perspectives on you know where they agree, where they disagree, and what are some tangible next steps. So um, what we want to first start with is just a round of introductions. Uh, very briefly, if you can, um, we'll start with Alex. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background um, and your role in your company. Thanks, David. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm Alex Dean. I'm one of the two co-founders of Snowplow and the CEO. And um, Snowplow helps brands to generate uh, very rich, low latency, first party behavioral, customer behavioral data um, into their warehouse, into their lake house. And brands um, use that to do to do different things, including some some CDP use cases that we'll talk about today. Um, but but it can be a real variety. So marketing attribution, digital analytics, recommendations, personalization. Um, so yeah, we've been we've been kind of following this topic very closely um, since it kind of um, emerged last year. And uh, yeah, delighted to be here. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Boris, why don't you go next? Thanks, David. Uh, I'm Boris Chavez. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO of Census. We're a data activation platform that connects natively to, you know, about 17, 18 data warehouses and allows teams to seamlessly sync that data into 150 plus business tools. So that way you can uh, drive all sorts of business use cases, the likes of which Alex is talking about, uh, but really spanning kind of marketing use cases that, that we're going to talk about today and then kind of what broadly the world describes as CDP uh, use cases and extending beyond that uh, to, you know, sales workflows and support workflows and product workflows and all these kinds of things. Cause you know, we sit uh, on top of this kind of infrastructure that the data organization uh, has built out. Uh, and yeah, we've started about four, five, four and a half years ago and just like now we get into these fun conversations. Great. Jason, why don't you go next? Great. Thank you, David. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, you know, I'm, I, I always joke, uh, I actually have a, you know, an academic machine learning background. It took me about five years into my PhD to realize that the value in data isn't in the algorithms, but it's how it's used. Um, you know, and two startups later, uh, you know, that's really the core mission of Simon. Um, you know, we've been in market for about eight years. Um, and our mission really is to align data and marketing teams uh, to affect uh, you know, data-driven marketing outcomes across segmentation, personalization, and beyond. Uh, you know, today we work with you know brands like JetBlue, uh, Equinox, and BarkBox, which are both data savvy uh, and also have you know great savvy personalized and data driven brands. Thanks, Jason. And uh, you know, just uh, to round it out, <clears throat> I'm the last uh, you know David Chan once again uh, from Deloitte Digital. Uh, I run our uh, CDP practice uh, here in the U.S. Um, I really help. Uh, what I focus on is helping clients uh, understand how to drive better personalized experiences, leveraging the combination of data signals, um, uh, machine learning, and data-driven insights, and then how to connect it with all the different technologies that are out there, which are a ton. Um, and so, you know, what we're going to try to do in the next uh, 45 to, to 50 minutes is really talk about, um, you know, get everyone's perspectives and also figure out uh, where the disagreement lies in some of these conversations. Um, I, I kind of joke that everyone who is actually familiar with some of the packaged and composable conversations will assume that, you know, Jason will obviously focus on, well, why is package better? Because it's kind of an end-to-end, -end, like fully baked solution, composable gives you more flexibility, scalability. And, um, you know, I'll just be the classic consultant and say, well, you know, it depends on, you know, the, the, the use cases and the, and, and how your team is set up and the sophistication and maturity, yada, yada, yada. So we'll see if that holds true. Um, so, so let's, let's kick it off. Um, what we won't do, by the way, is not talk about why CDPs are important. I think the fact that um, we're here uh, investing time and, and providing services uh, in this space, it kind of, 
we don't need to belabor that point. And you probably joined because you're already interested in either you have a CDP or you're actually planning on implementing a CDP. And so um, that we won't do. But, but let's just talk about a little bit about the idea of a customer data divide. So the idea of a customer data divide is this um, concept where we believe that IT sort of sits on like one side of the brain on the left and then, uh, you know, business, whether it's marketing, sales, service, commerce, uh, you know, teams sit on the right. And there's too many degrees of separation between them because the data teams are focused on producing high quality data. Um, the, the, the marketing teams on the right are just trying to run campaigns, drive personalized experiences. They don't care necessarily uh, or understand and comprehend whether the data is good or not. They just need the data there to be populated in their applications of choice to actually do their jobs. And that's where the, the friction is, where if those teams don't properly collaborate, um, they, they often uh, create some sort of uh, misunderstanding of like what tools and technologies to actually choose to sort of power what uh, I think Jason likes to call the workflows of, of the organization. Um, so, Jason, do you actually agree with that, that there's a growing customer data divide that exists? Um, and do you think it's growing? Do you think it's getting better? Like, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, no, a, a thousand percent. I mean, it's hard to talk about package versus composable CDPs without you know, first asking what's composable and what's packaged. Um, you know, and really, when we view the world, you know, you know, you know, whenever, you know, if you think about how a CDP works, there are two sides of the CDP. There's the data in and there's the applications out. Um, you know, and, and look, you know, today we have, you know, three, three vendors, uh, which have an approach, um, you know, related to both composable and packaged CDPs. Uh, you know, there, there, there's a whole generation of previous, uh, CDPs, which are, you know, much more packaged than our approach. Um, you know, and our approach ultimately is really one of integrating into best of breed data infrastructure. Uh, and with that, a thesis being that there is this divide between data and marketing and it needs to be bridged. Uh, but at the same time. Uh, you know, the market really needs uh, a package approach on the application side. Um, you know, 10 years ago, there were 350 MarTech vendors. Five years ago, there were 6,800 MarTech vendors. Uh, when Chief MarTech did the report this year, there were over 11,000 MarTech vendors. Uh, and my question is, do we need to go and introduce the entirety of the modern marketing data set into the complexity of MarTech? Um, you know, my sense is maybe not. Great. Um, yeah, or go for it. All right. I was just going to say, I, I don't think anyone, I don't know that anyone wants more complexity, mm -hmm. to be fair. Uh, I don't think that's something anyone wakes up in the morning going, I wish my life was more complicated and I wish there were more tools in my life. Uh, I do think there is a, what, what do you call it, David? A da data divide. Uh, it's a cool term. Um, in that, I don't know, it's growing probably just because there's the amount of data at every company is growing and yet the outcomes are not necessarily getting that much better. And over and over, I see actual people in role, right? Whether they're on what you call a data or IT team or a marketing team, and they seem to not even realize what they have. And so I think one of the things that we are all, I'm gonna say collectively guilty of, and Jason, you talk about you know your, your PhD background, right? Like, I think, from our cocoon in the metaphorical valley, like we always talk about the next big thing and everyone's like AI this and that and the other, and it's all awesome. And, and God knows I'd love to spend time on it, but I have found over and over again that people don't seem to have even the basics integrated, connected. And I have seen marketing teams go, I wish I had X, Y, and Z from, you know, the data team and the data team's going, I have X, Y, and Z and then some, and you have never asked for it. And like, it's just sitting here for you to use. And they don't seem to know how to talk to each other. And I think some of this can be intermediated by software. Some of it is clearly organizational and they need you, David, to come and fix it. Uh, but I see this over and over again. And so at a pure, like just to answer that original question, like definitely there is a divide. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's, I, I assume it's growing. Uh, it's hard for me to tell, but I think that the the impact of that divide is growing because because you know now you have to have these personalized experiences and if you don't do that like like modern marketing is super sophisticated. Yeah, I I agree. I think the divide is like it's a it's a cultural piece or it's a process piece, but 
to to sort of build on what on what Boris just said, I think that the there's almost this like new data gravity well that these data teams are building. And it's becoming more and more, I think, like kind of almost um, challenging for those marketing teams because they realize that there's more and more of that data in there and they can't get at it. So that's the divide. But actually, there's just more and more of that valuable data um, that is being like centrally consolidated, governed, whatever in, you know, warehouse or lake house. And, and that that makes the divide feel more painful. Um, but but the data is there. Thanks. Um, so, you know, if I were to sort of summarize, you know, I think Jason, um, you really think that there is a customer data <clears throat> divide because you're really trying to figure out now how to integrate with growing data infrastructure, but also um, the growing complexity in MarTech, um, how to how to tie all those things together. Um, Boris, I think you rightly said, yeah, no one's looking for greater complexity. It just lands in their lap and then you have to navigate it. And so um, some, and the, and the challenge is some folks don't actually recognize that there is an issue, right? They don't actually recognize what they have in front of them, which means if they don't recognize it, how are they gonna unlock it for their organization? Right. Um, and then, you know, Alex, uh, to your point, um, it is a cultural thing, right? So it's not just a technology solve we're talking about. It's sort of the, the DNA of the organization of how they're wired up to actually do work. And the frustration lies when they might, um, like in one case, Boris is like, they don't even recognize it. I think Alex, you're saying they don't even recognize it because there are these like data gravity wells in which are black holes. Um, oh, sorry. You're actually saying that they do recognize it. It's almost like this black box um, that you can't yeah, access, right? They don't know how to get to it. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So, so, so let's move on. Um, if we believe that, you know, there's a customer data divide, uh, I'm assuming, you know, it's not just that, right? The customer data divide is, is, is one thing, but there's other reasons um, why it's hard to then say, okay, I want to pick a seat. Like I want a CDP, right? You made a command on a CDP, but I, I don't know which approach to, to, to take. So um, why don't we start with you, Boris? Why, why do you think it's hard for organizations to just pick a CDP, whether it's, you know, packaged or composable, regardless of what side of the fence you are, why, why is it just hard to make that decision? I think there's a lot of reasons, uh, uh, but let me see if I can pull out a couple. One, let's not kid ourselves. And, and Jason, you've been in the game a long time. Like it's jargon, right? It's jargon. It's a very good name. It's actually very representative of what the thing is supposed to be doing. Uh, and I would argue that your your own infra at some level in your own company is a form of customer data platform because what else are you storing <laughs> but data relevant to your business and your customers? It's like it's either about the widgets you produce or the widgets you you know you're going to sell and the users who want them. Like so so at some level, I think it's one reason people have trouble with this is they may not genuinely recognize that there is a thing with a name that they should be looking into, right? Uh, and if all we do today in a, in a way is to say, this is a three letter acronym that you should be thinking about, we, we may have actually done our job for the, for the market. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll do better than that. But, but, but I actually think that's one reason. And I, 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 I really mean that. I think people have the outcome problem. They're going like, I wish I could build more personalized, uh, uh, uh customer experiences. And they don't know how to make the leap from that to, I need a solution that people would call a CDP. Uh, and then I think what's hard, even if you do know that, is I think most businesses are unique. Uh, uh, they have, whether the thing that they make or the way that they take it to market, some aspect of that is unique. And uh, the a lot of what they might come across in the industry is stamped out for a, you know, kind of archetype. It's like, ah, you're an e-commerce company. I have the answer for you, right? And, and when you somehow don't fit that mold perfectly, now you have this kind of a problem. And, and I think that's, the reason people struggle with this, right? Is that like, they don't genuinely themselves feel like there is a thing that represents them uniquely. And, and so this is where, you know, kind of, we came at it from the other end 
and you know by building kind of let's call it Lego pieces that allow you to you know make the CDP out of your own ecosystem, your own tools, people can construct it in a way that works for them, no matter what they are. Right. So, well, Boris, kind of, I, think, I think that's interesting, Boris. Um, I was talking to, to Scott Brinker about this the other day, and he he has this expression. I don't know how common it is, but he calls it like inverse Conway's law. And it's the idea, so Conway's law, the idea that like you ship, you ship software based on the structure of your engineering team or your company, right. inverse Conway's law being the idea that you end up sort of doing unnatural transformations of your business to fit the kind of, you know, pre-packed cookie cutter tools that you've adopted. Um, and, and, and that's why he's really bullish on the composable, the composable side of things. So it's, in, it's interesting to hear you say that. Um, yeah. Um, I actually really like the that Conway in way, uh, Con Conway's in or inverse the inverse of, <laughs> of Conway's law. And, you have to uh, define Conway's it, law first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I had to Google that. And, uh, it, it was like, oh, and there's like inverse Con Conway maneuvers to avoid it. Uh, okay, cool. Oh, I did so, not know that. <laughs> Yes, there is. You, you look it up. Um, I, I like it. I think I'm going to borrow it from Scott. Uh, uh, what he's trying to do. Uh, so Alex, like, what's your take? Like, what, what makes it hard outside of the customer data divide that we, we already touched on? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think, I think, um, terminology is tough. I think, you know, CDP is, is, is meant to use so many, is meant to mean so many different things. Like, you know, there are wildly different engagement channels for different CDPs, totally different latencies for some of them. So I think, yeah, I think the taxonomy is really, that, that doesn't, that doesn't help things. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's a big part of it. Okay, Jason, your take. Um, well, one thing we haven't talked about yet you know, that David, you mentioned very briefly is workflows and, you know, ultimately, you know, if you have the data and you activate the data, where does it go? Uh, and it goes into another system, um, you know, and really one of the dirty secrets of MarTech, uh, you know, you know, and, and marketing automation is that, you know, too many times automation comes at the expense of data engineering and IT resources, doing a lot of the man, a woman behind the curtains to affect the automation. Um, mm -hmm. you know, if you just look at it mechanically, you have you know, multi-terabyte and multi-petabyte you know, Snowflake and BigQuery stores. They're shipping data into Salesforce, which is backed by some Oracle database. They're shipping data into other uh, CRM platforms that are built on MongoDB or, or, you know, or Elasticsearch. Uh, and what gives? Um, ultimately, you know, how if the goal, if one of the fundamental goals of CDP is to enable business stakeholders and marketers you know, to affect data-driven personalization uh, and operations, uh, then what's going on here and where do things break? Um, you know, so I think that's a fundamental challenge. You know, I think that's also a fundamental point of misalignment across uh, marketing and data to get to your point. Um, you know, that marketing doesn't really, you know, they, they can't enunciate what they need because they're not technical, uh, but they know what needs to happen. Uh, and on the data side, you know, you know, there are these solutions that are in front of them, you know, you know and, and many brands are at a point where they built you know, fairly robust and sophisticated uh, you know, centralized, you know, views of the customer. Um, but you know, still, we find the two sides of the house is talking past each other. Yeah, Jason, um, we, we've definitely discussed uh, this workflow uh, challenge before. Um, tell me, tell me what you think is the answer to that, though, because uh, you, you're not going to be able to change what the Martech applications, what's their backend DB, right? You can only control uh, what you choose as your enterprise data warehouse uh, stack or the, the package CDP that you you want to push forth in the market. Um, so if there's there, if there's differences in tech, right, um, that you have to integrate these workflows into, what what do you do? Look, ultimately the questions are you know you know when you look at end to end campaign production, you know across segmentation, across personalization, across identity management, across experimentation, across multi channel activation, whatever it might be. Um, you know, you need to ask, you know, which of these steps require fine grain, uh, large scale access to data and which do not, um, you know, if you want to build a, an unpersonalized email template, like, you know, you can do that in any MarTech tool that exists out there. Um, yeah, but if you want to, you know, to build a highly targeted, uh, you know, personalized message, you know, you're going to need some level of access to your data. You know, so it's really a matter of looking at your application stack and looking at ownership and looking at, you know, across, you know, your data engineer, your data analyst, your marketing analyst, your marketing operations folks, you know, and your end, uh, you know, folks who are responsible for execution, who owns what and what are the tools that they're using to get things done? Um, because ultimately, if, 
if, if your business as usual campaign development cycle requires going cross functionally to a data team, you're, you're just not going to move quickly. And as a result, you're not going to be automated. Good points. I do. So just to, oh, go. Sorry, go ahead. Go, Boris. No, 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 go ahead. No, I'm just going to summarize. Oh, yeah. I was just going to agree that, you know, that last thing you said, Jason, is super important, right? Ultimately, like we, 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 we want to bring it back to outcomes and like agility, agility matters. And uh, the one thing, you know, you say like, the, you know, one doesn't know how to, to specify the requirements to the other, right? In some weird way. And, and, and I totally buy it. I mean, I think that's a perennial problem in all, all interactions that involve software at some level. Uh, uh, but, but I actually think every, at every company, I'm willing to bet right now, if you're in marketing, like there is a data person at your company that not only can, but wants to be deputized into a growth engineer, growth marketer. Like they just don't have the opportunity to, and they don't know how as well. And so like the, the, if you, that's one of the ways in which you can improve agility, right. Is to tighten the loop between those two and actually, you know, teach them to yearn for the sea, right. As they say, like, that's how you go, like, that's how you go across the ocean. And like, there is, there are people on that side of, of, of the house that you know, they might not know the lingua franca of marketers. They might be like, what's MarTech? <laughs> but, but they want those same outcomes for the customer, right? They care about sending a good email campaign to the hardcore users and sending something different to the hardcore fans of their product versus the, let's call it, you know, casual user so that they don't get, you know, crappy messaging and they want to participate in that. They have the, the capability to generate that score. They, they, they can do those things and they can do them very fast. Uh, uh, and I, I would argue like the days of sending a super generic email still exist. Don't get me wrong. People still send bad basic emails. They should send good basic emails. <laughs> but, but, but like there is a desire for people to, uh, to, to, I don't know, better, better message their customers. Right. And I think that's shared. That's not just on the marketing team. Uh, can I can I jump back to Jason's point on 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 the workflows because I think I think that was a that was a super important important point um, and I, I Jason I agree with you I think um, I'm never going to say business uh, processes aren't aren't super important and and we found ourselves having to to build a lot of workflow into Snowplow around the you know sort of data generation side of, side of things to to reflect how companies want to do it but I think I think the question then becomes like well where where should the workloads and the workflows live. And Jason, you, you wrote some interesting stuff. I was looking for sort of spicy spicy takes and differences of opinions. And you wrote some interesting stuff around, you thought uh, reverse ETL would be a bit of a governance nightmare, right? Because, which I think means you think, you know, the kind of governance, the data governance workflow should be should be in those CDPs and in those downstream marketing tools. But I'm, I'm not sure that's right. I'm- I would like, not agree with that for the, for the record, but go on. I'm not sure that's right. I, I'm, I, I think that there's a lot of tooling and a lot of thinking going into governance of customer data inside warehouses and lake houses. And I, I suspect- I, I, we're, this... we're, Yeah, no, I mean, Alex, I agree hundred percent. The governance <laughs> needs to be owned at the warehouse level, a thousand okay. percent. And I think the biggest, look, I think the biggest problem, you know, there was a, a you know, segment, you know, sort of got all of us into a big, uh, a, you know, a terrible area a decade ago when they made what I think is the worst assigned decision of any CDP, uh, you know, that they could have made as a CDP. And that's the notion of activating a profile, being copying all of your sensitive customer data into one of what is today over 11,000 different MarTech applications. Who knows okay. who's operating these applications? Who knows what credit card they were purchased on by you know, what you know, junior marketer at what you know, at, you know, aspect of the business? But you know, the, the fact of the matter you know, lies is so many enterprises have cathedrals of Snowflake and BigQuery permissions, permissions set up that they report to at a public company level only for the data to be activated into uh, you know, dark corners of the internet where customer data is completely ungoverned, unknown, uh, and at tremendous levels of risk. I, I totally agree, Jason. I think, I think the whole tag management side of things and like browser-based relaying of customer data took us, took us down a very weird fever dream. I think that's uh, just, just, uh, just my hands are clean. My hands are clean. <laughs> I just want to be clear on this. I, I, my hands are clean. All right. So good discussion, guys. Let's... So let's close out this section, right? So the, the question was, you know, why, why do we think it's hard outside of the customer data divide? I think uh, Alex and Boris, no surprise, um, agreed that it's really about like all the random esoteric jargon and terminologies, you know, thrown out there and a lack of uh, definition 
um, industry definition of like what CDP is and isn't, et cetera. Um, and then the fact that, yeah, Boris, every company is different. They sell different things and then they operate differently. So um, if you don't have common definitions and there's no one size fits all approach to CDP from a technology or an approach perspective, how is anyone going to, uh, you know, uh, kind of solve for or, or hit a moving target, right? Or as the goalposts keeps on getting pushed. Um, Jason, I hear you on workflows. Um, I think it, it's, um, it's, uh, it's obviously like very important. And Alex, I think, he, actually, I, I think Jason, you were the one who was um, talking about the data engineer, right? Who wants to uh, stretch into the marketing side. Um, I actually, I said there's a there's a secret desire for every a lot of people. In the oh, data that was Boris. Yeah, that was okay. Boris. Yeah, I, sure. I think it's a great look. I think as as data infrastructure and this whole ecosystem evolves, you know, we're going to see a decentralization of data, which is a good thing because the tooling is easier to use. It's more sophisticated. It's more powerful. Right. You don't yeah, need to right. you know, be an expert. You know, with years yeah. of training, etc. Mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. literally had a client meeting earlier today where um, that data team lead basically told me, because uh, we were talking about some gaps in the in the teams uh, to do some of the work. And he said, you know, if only my, my client uh, leadership uh, gave me that opportunity because I actually know all the tribal knowledge and can actually do this work. Um, but equally as important are the marketers who are willing to stretch in the other direction, right? So it is about sort of how do you find people who, I mean, there are always going to be people who just want to live on the edges, right? Um, of that, uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of those sides of the coin or whatever. Um, but then figure out who has the potential or capability to kind of like cross over. I think those are the ones you want to, you want to keep and find in your organizations. Um, okay, cool. So, so let's, let's sort of move on now. I mean, I think this was more of a setup. And I know it took like 27 minutes again to the setup, but let's actually talk about <laughs> the, the areas where, you know, you guys might actually disagree on. So um, to start, um, I was actually going to have make Jason argue for the composable side and then Alex and Boris to, you know, argue for the package side, but I'm not going to do that because I was unclear how that was going to turn out. So we're going to, we're going to take the safe route because, you know, I'm Deloitte and I'm, I'm very conservative. Um, Let's take the uh, let's talk about the arguments for the composable CDP. Um, Alex, why don't you go first? Um, yeah, sure thing. So I think that um, look, it comes back a bit to that idea of um, the inverse Conway's law. It comes back to the idea that there are a lot of a lot of marketing teams, a lot of martech teams that have you know struggled a lot with with, with fully packaged solutions. Um, this data gravity well is emerging with the warehouse and the lake house, and they just want to plug direct into that. It, it doesn't mean that package CDPs, it doesn't mean all those workflows aren't, aren't valuable. And, and that's why your, your, your dual zone approach makes a lot of sense to me, David. But it just means that there are use cases that you wanna start moving much closer to the data, much closer to the, to, to the warehouse. And so it's kind of a gradualistic approach and there'll be, you know, there'll be a different killer app, there'll be a different reason to go composable. Um, you know, it might be about low latency, it might be about you know, more unified customer behavioral profile with, with sensitive data that you can't put into a, a you know, a third party MarTech. So, so there'll be different reasons for it. It'll be gradualistic, um, but I think it makes a lot of sense. And um, when we sort of started down that kind of composable track last year, um, I'd kind of forgotten about the whole composable DX movement, a uh, digital experience movement, and like Mac and headless, you know, CMSs and all that kind of stuff. But but, um, but that's real as well, and, and it's real for the same reason, which is, to Boris's earlier point, once you kind of, you know, outgrow the pack, the cookie cutter packages, you have to start assembling different pieces together. So that's, yeah, that's kind of my take on that. Boris, Alex said everything. Right? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, can, I can add to that. I can add to that. Uh, uh, um, I mean, I think there's, there's a couple things I can add to that. One is... Uh, Actually, Jason, you said it, right? Like you said categorically, like governance at this point, if it doesn't already, it should live in your, let's call it data warehouse side of the house. Yeah. Uh, um, and to me, that, that argues for kind of what Alex is trying to say about this gravity well is like the, the data warehouse already, like 
the data team already has attributes that you're not using. It already has governance you should be leveraging, right? It just already has so much accrued value. And, and so it works as a, uh, as what I'll call like a really scalable, not just activation layer that we help make possible, but, but also an interoperability layer, right? Uh, and so the, the, you, you should stay as close to it as possible, if only to, to get your cake and eat it too, right? Which is, and cake being like the extra attributes and the eating it too is having the governance not get screwy, right? And, and the way to do that in my mind is to stay as close to that side of the world as possible and to compose with those kind of pieces that exist. So like governance is something you would then compose with. Um, so that's one. Two, David, I would say the, you, there are, there are, everyone will always say at some level, right, that we interoperate or we integrate. Like the, the, we're in fact, you know, Jason and I are both in some level integration companies, right? Like let's, let's, let's remove all the jargon. Like we integrate with other products. Like so by definition, right? And so it's a question of how, whether that's grafted on or whether that's um, uh, native to the design. And, and I think when you look at things in a packaged way, right? If we're going to talk about this as packaged versus composable, packaged can of course be integrated with other things. Like if you give me enough time and energy, I will figure out how to connect anything to anything. Like, like you just give me enough engineering time, I will figure it out, right? Uh, I will scrape the website, you know, I'll do it, right? Um, but when you're, when you've made assumptions tied to like an integrated experience, then it's harder for anyone to pull out any specific piece. And, and so, but what Alex is saying, and I agree is like, you are eventually going to have a workflow that doesn't fit uh, uh, the, the package. And so you have to, 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 to kind of combine it with something else so that it actually gives you the workflow, the outcome that you want. And, and that's where composability just as a concept is, is going to be, you know, superior. Um, so, Alex is, I'm, I'm a plus one on Alex, but if you wanted some extra, that's that's what I'd go. Yeah, so I, so I think to summarize sort of Alex and Boris's points, um, it's really about uh, composable kind of gives you the best ability to, to scale and kind of um, get you closer to, to the data and, and tie it to applications. Um, you can start with a CDP, but you'll, you might quickly outgrow uh, the functions that a package CDP uh, supplies from a, you know, as complex workflows, you know, once, once business teams figure out like the easy low hanging fruit, as you start tackling more complex workflows, uh, package might not be enough. Um, and this idea that, yeah, we're all, uh, all of these are sort of integration. It's all about integrations, right? Either unifying the data or democratizing and sending data out. Um, but the question is, is, is are ones built more for in, interoperability or is one more as I think Boris, you mentioned, like, is it just more of like an adapter? You're like, right, right. Plugging right. things in on the, the back end just to c convert it and transform it to fit something versus natively yeah. designed. Like Alex's, like Alex's freaking plugs from the UK. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> Jason, you have a lot to respond to. <laughs> I mean, again, I think, um, there, 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 there are a lot of you know, category definitional phrases that we've sort of danced around and talked about. Uh, I, I do think there's rough alignment across you know the three of us on um, you know how the how modern data infrastructure you know the cloud data warehouse needs to play a central role uh, around powering uh, these applications. Um, you know, I, I do think that there's a separate question around whether that also applies that a CDP needs to be unbundled. Um, you know, and mm. you know, the question is, why can't there be an approach you know, that sits on top of the warehouse, you know, plugs into real time streams, um, you, know, you know, plugs into maybe other APIs as well, uh, you know, and provides a package application, you know, that affects, you know, the problems that markers need to solve. And I guess getting back to your question, I think, you know, when we, we think about the benefits of the package on the application side, it's, 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 it, I think it's pretty simple because yes, like, you know, I a hundred percent agree, Boris, you know, there, there's certain, you know, you know, brands that, you know, certain companies with incredibly complex identity requirements where they might have to build a whole bunch on their own. 
Um, you know, but, but the vast majority of brands, even for brands of multiple business units, can be you know, supported with relatively simple out-of-the-box identity management, especially as they want to go from zero to one, then maybe one to two, three, four, and five. Uh, now, if they want to go to nine or 10, like, you know, that's a different story. And then, you know, then there's a, you know, there, there's a slew of questions on how to get there. Um, you know, but ultimately, I think, you know, when you look at, you know, just getting back to your, I think, a second question, whatever was, David, you know, why do marketing teams and data teams, even today in 2023, the decade of data, uh, whatever, you know, crowning accomplishment you want to put around where we are from a, uh, in, a, in a chat GPT you know, data affected world, uh, you know, why is this seemingly you know, incredibly you know, simple problem still so hard? Uh, the answer really just comes down to the maturity curve of where the market is today. Um, you know, and I think, you know, if we're back here in, in two, three, four, five years, um, you know, I think, you know, the landscape will be different. Uh, but today, um, you know, I think for, you know, you know, for many brands, a package solution uh, represents uh, just a simpler way that will have less risk, uh, will be less dependent on, you know, you know, problems that, quite frankly, data teams have not solved before uh, you know, to get to the end of the road. Could, David, can I jump back to the interoperability point? Because I think I think that's super super interesting. I think um, the CDP market's been around for for some time now, and I I feel like with with the lake houses and, and the warehouses, right? Like interoperability, composability, if you will, unbundling is almost being sort of brought to the CDP market, um, and 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 that kind of means that SQL and and things like SQL, and you know, then it'll be um, Jack, Jack, GPT written SQL, which will be which will be fun. Um, that becomes the layer of interoperability, right? But but the CDPs, I think, they've had a long time where they could have interoperated. They could have had more like, you know, plug and play APIs to each other or to best of breed, you know, behavioral data creation or identity stitch or whatever. And that kind of didn't happen. So I think I think it's an, it's interesting that that's kind of happening in the market now, but it it, it, it wasn't done independently by the CDPs before. Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> redirecting back to Jason, I mean, do you, do you believe that uh, package CDP solutions are interoperable uh, versus uh, taking more of like an adapter approach? I mean, look, yeah, it, it, it's certainly our strategy. Um, you know, I think you know another thing that we we haven't talked about here is is look, um, you know, quite frankly, routing real time streaming data through uh, a cloud data warehouse today. You know, is not you know really the best way to route real time you know, you know streaming data if you want to affect and and real time use cases it can sort of be done you know if you're really on the cutting edge of where these you know, you know these technologies are but it doesn't work all that great um, you know so I think when you look at the totality of you know where enterprise data exists today uh, obviously the lake house and the warehouse being a big you know focal point of that um, you know but also thinking about you know, how real-time streams fit into this, how API microservices fit into this, uh, and how, what the broader picture looks like. Um, you know, I think there, you know, you know, there goes bigger questions to ask around, you know, what, around what this application stack needs to support. So, so Jason, you, you said that you, you think it's not, it's not a good approach because uh, it's very hard to figure out how to stream real-time data into um, an enterprise data warehouse, kind of like what using, you know, something like Snowplow. And then using reverse ETL uh, or to do data activation to like a Martech technology, right? Um, if you want, if you so, want to session, if you want to sessionize web events and then you know you know, you know, you know affect you know and, and then activate with I don't know five or ten or thirty minute latency, it's a great you know it's 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 you know tried and true. So Alex, um, you, you, I mean, you talk about in your even in your intro. You, you do real-time streaming of data into the data warehouse. And Boris, you're saying 30 minutes set up, <clears throat> I got you going. Uh, what do you guys say to that? Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one. I think um, Snowplow's real-time un, under the hood. Um, so many of the use cases we've been powering for the last few years have been you know, in the data warehouse. And a lot of those have been run off like you know, cron jobs and, and pieces of SQL. But all, all of the big, um, you know, uh, data data vendors um, are moving to real time. Um, there's, you know, they're building real time streams as like first class primitives inside of their their data clouds. Um, so so yeah, like I, I think I think it will it, it should all work. Like the real time use cases, the low latency use cases, we should be able to move them in. And you know, I'd, I'd be amazed if if Boris isn't looking at like you know, real time reverse ETL. 
Yeah, I think um, the the from a technological perspective, David, I think that's going to get solved if not already solved. Like, like snowplow is real time. Census is like probably sub minute, which is not you know computer science real time, obviously, but but is definitely better than thirty minutes. But um, the you are then constrained, no doubt, by the organization, because and this uh, this Jason, I will give you one hundred percent right, which is the the what organizations have built in house that is very well governed and has all those features that we want to 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 work with, right? They have not generally built that in a way that it can run at that velocity. This is true. Um, but then it's a question of at that point, like you know, it's it's like you're 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 uh, you're looking at a you know where the puck is going. I'm Canadian, so I'm gonna use the hockey analogy, right? And you, if 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 real time does not give you governance over time, like you're gonna have a problem. And and that's what I think, Jason. That's kind of one of the things you said, right, with the segment thing, like ten years ago, right? Like where it's like we ended up with this 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 this, this thing that became ungovernable, right? Uh, and became its own difficult mess to, to deal with. Uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, um, and so I think the incentives are deeply, deeply aligned with the data stack becoming more real time. Uh, and those organizations learning how to do that in a way that is more real time. And to me, it's like, I get to work with, you know, a whole different levels of sophistication. And, and I do take to heart something that Jason has said to me before, which is like, you know, when you grow up in the Valley, you might overestimate sophistication. And I'm like, take that to heart. Um, and what I've seen is the, um, if I look at the world's most sophisticated companies in this regards, uh, in fact, and many of those companies are fully in-house. Like, you know, they're the kinds that build this, like they don't even use, any of our tools, right? Like they, they, they are, they, they, you know, they hire hundreds of engineers and do this themselves in-house because uh, they're, you know, big tech. And they're able, you know, th th at the peak, this is what they're able to do. They're, they're actually able to de deliver both centralized view of the data and real time. So, so that's where the puck is going. So, so I, I, I think Alex and I can do our best. Of course, the organization and the underlying technology has to improve as well. And, and right now that would be a constraint for sure. That's a great point. So, so let's, let's, let's kind of shift gears, right? Um, when, when you think about packaged uh, CDPs versus uh, companies taking a composable approach, uh, it, it's very easy if you think of left brain, right brain again, you know, enterprise IT or data team sitting on the left and then marketing and business teams on the right. Um, it does feel like, maybe package CDPs are more focused on the business teams because they got the nice UIs and the self-serve capability. Um, whereas, uh, you know, more composable CDPs are more targeted toward uh, the other end of the spectrum. So if you were, from your perspective, do you guys all believe that you're actually serving the same end users or do you guys believe that, um, you know, you serve a certain, certain type of, uh, team in the, in, in organizations. Um, I'll start with, actually, I want to start with, uh, Alex. Yeah, I, it's something we've thought about a lot at, a lot at Snowplow, especially as the kind of the, the, the data teams out there have matured and they've become higher, um, higher profile inside their organizations. I think for, I think for the composability side of the house, you've you've got to have an organization that has the will the will to do it right the will to 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 bring some best of breed components together and i think that means they've got they've got to have internal you know data platform data engineering chops or have a really strong like you know si culture and be really willing to bring in firms to help on that um we're doing a lot of um explaining to the martech and the marketing side of the house of why they would want this approach but but yeah we're like we, we we've got a win over a, a data team or, or a, a you know a data si to kind of pull these pieces together and, and and build something awesome for the company so yeah we're not we're not going direct to the to the marketing to the cmo for example yeah boris uh do you see the same thing on your side 
I think by our very birth, I would say, like we have served two people. Uh, 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 and that comes with a lot of, let's call it pain that I'm not going to discuss today uh, 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 in terms of building a business. But but we we have always served a data, let's call it professional, and given them the ability, like I kind of said, to deputize them into the outcomes, right? To To get them out of, I just do analysis and hope for the best into your powering business outcomes, right? Uh, and we do that with really great native capabilities for them, right? So it's not just saying we work in the warehouse, which is like our, you know, how we were born, but it's also giving them uh, uh, the ability to back the, their 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 behavior in our product via Git, which is what they're you know used to now, to uh, give them CI checks in their system so that when they're doing data engineering workflows, like they know exactly what they're going to break downstream. It's like we we are very much where they are, right? Like in their panes of glass. Um, and then we have always worked with marketing and business ops users, right? From the very beginning of our company. Uh, and they are maybe not the CMO per se, right? But they are very much in the weeds of trying to build the business workflow. Uh, and they are the ones who are like, I want to be able to self-serve the, the attributes I want into the place in Salesforce or in Marketo that I want. And the data person doesn't know where that should go in Marketo or Salesforce, but that person does. And what they need is the ease of use, the uh, uh, let's call it the guardrails that give that make them successful. Because so Jason's totally right. Like there's a language barrier in some ways, right? So, so that side of our user base, like we give them, you know, we we protect them from, for example, uh, um, syncing certain kinds of data because, like, you know, that's like playing with fire, right? Th those kinds of things, uh, uh, and 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 constrain them down to even something that we launched, uh, you know, two, two days ago called the Audience Hub that really gives them a user experience like designed, tailored for them, uh, uh, even though it's underneath powered by all the same kind of capabilities. So so I'm in the, and I say this in all honesty, it, it is difficult to serve two, but we, we, we've always served both. So Jason, um, you know, Alex thinks he serves uh, primarily, you know, sort of data teams. Boris thinks he serves both. Uh, I'm sure you're gonna be, you have something to respond to Boris with. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I, I would, respond the same, you know, like my response to Boris would be, you know, look, you know, the first point of response was focusing on data teams. And the second was marketing ops. Um, you know, our perspective, you know, is, you know, CDP needs to serve the needs of the end business user. Um, you know, you know, and is not your data strategy. It enables your data strategy. Um, you know, so we've, you know, for us, when we always think about our primary user. It's, you know, it's a hundred percent focused around the CMO. Uh, you know, and around, um, you know, core, uh, you know, and business facing applications, CRM director, et cetera, uh, you know, marketing ops as well. But, you know, the data analyst plays into this, obviously, as your data engineers. But, you know, we just have, um, you know, a slightly different core focus around the problems that we're solving. Great. Um, so with 10 minutes left, let's try to switch gears and try to help companies and, 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 and different uh, audience members understand what, what could be a path forward, right? Um, because I think, um, you know, there, there are merits to both. Um, the question is, uh, how do we help companies navigate it? So uh, what I want to do now is actually uh, take a little time to introduce, uh, you know, something that I put forth uh, called the dual zone approach. Alex kind of mentioned it earlier. People are interested in what that means. It's this idea where um, instead of trying to find one technology stack or not technology stack, but literally one vendor to basically solve all your CDP use cases and capabilities. Um, it's to re reevaluate and think, okay, what, what are the, what is, what are the CDP capabilities? Like establish a CDP capability framework for organization of these are the CDP capabilities I want to be able to do. Then you figure out what your use cases are. And then you figure out what technologies enable the capabilities that support those use cases, right? And so from a dual zone perspective, it actually is a very composable approach, but where we're saying is composability can get out of hand. I think uh, uh, Boris, who were talking about building computers about like, it can go like, what degree are you, you taking it to? And so the idea is, um, and I think Jason, you mentioned, you, you seemed open to this idea of like, you could take a packaged solution, like a packaged CDP, and augment it with other composable parts to kind of create the 
create a, a, a CDP capability, right? And it's and the idea is about how do you then use a dual zone to uh, orchestrate, right? Not only the workflows, but actually the roles and responsibility of teams in order, hey, build data products, build propensity scores, build campaigns and experiences, the content and creative, how do you figure out how to organize teams to actually execute that end to end workflow? So I'll pause right there and uh, get your reactions. Alex, love it or hate it? Yeah, I like it. I think it. I think it speaks to the gradualistic. No, 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 Alex. I said love it or hate it. <laughs> you can't. You can't. You can't like it. <laughs> Sorry, David. I love it. I love it. All right, wait. Okay, good. Um, just, just checking. <laughs> I think it. I think it speaks to the gradualistic approach, and and it 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 does the thing that I think is really important, which it it does the mastering of the customer data in the warehouse, right? And I think that's, that's, I just really strongly think that's where it needs to be done. Okay, Jason, what's your take? Um, I hate it, but for a different reason than why Alex loves it. Uh, you know, it feels draconian to me. Uh, you have marketing data want to collaborate. Uh, you know, there should just be a set of sanctioned data tables that uh, you know, marketing, you know, and the business can access, you're not being fed uh, through an application that they, you know, you know, ostensibly under the dual zone model, don't control Boris under, you know, your ICP is a little bit different, um, you know, but should not be fed data based off of a piece of technology they don't, they don't own. So for me, I think, you know, this feels antithetical to the way a, a modern data-driven organization should be thinking about, you know, developing a data competency that empowers the business broadly. And if you look at how BI tools and other applications have been built, you know, they don't work in this way. Boris. So I have to answer first, love it or hate it, yeah? Yeah, um, yeah apparently. I just want to be clear that <laughs> I think my position is silent. almost certainly the synthesis of these two guys, but but um, I will, I will for the sake of the, the Manichaean view, I will say love it. Uh, um, which, by the way, Alex, gradualistic, is that a new word in England? Like, is that, a, is that actually a word? I'm not sure. Okay, all right. I give you credit. You guys get to create new ones, I suppose. Uh, uh, um, so my... To me, if it furthers collaboration between these organizations, it is of the good. I have some of Jason's, like, I, if I were to try to take the, the, the combined view, it's like, we should maximize the synaptic relation connections between data and business, like, as much as possible. These things should not be uh, uh, two ends of the organization. I, I find that to be completely ridiculous. Uh, um, it'd be like saying the CFO, it's like, well, I just... I just decide budgets like what? No, you, you, you're helping drive the business. Like you're, you're not just doing the accounting. Right. And the, the, I think it's the same with, with data. So, so I will put love it as my answer, David, only because like, I think it, at, at, your dual zone at least implies there's, there's connectivity between them as opposed to two worlds, which I think historically the world of package CDPs have given us a, data competency within marketing that is wholly separate from the data competency in the data organization. And we should get away from that. Uh, and, 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 but my view would be like, just, just, just literally maximize connectivity between these two worlds. Yep. And listen, um, uh, going back to, to, to Jason's hate on my, uh, my dual zone approach. I think the idea is that um, when there is so much noise in the matrix right now, around we know what we have to do but it's it's like that messy closet that you don't know where to start uh sometimes it's easy to just start with like pushing things into piles right and and uh it, it, and to alex's point it's like it is a gradualistic approach it's helping companies figure out okay don't get stuck by paralysis by analysis there's a there's an approach that allows you to sort of it's almost like safe agile like it's a it's a it's a gradualistic <laughs> alex approach to helping you bring those, those workflows uh, closer together, not literally the, the distance, but actually the teams in which uh, they collaborate. So, uh, and since I'm the moderator, I don't, I don't let Jason uh, respond to that. And we're gonna move on to the next, <laughs> to, to the next slide. All right, sorry, the, 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 the next. For my four-year-old, I asked him if he wants PB, for my four-year-old, I asked him if he wants PB and J or mac and cheese. And uh, for the eight-year-old, I let him go into the fridge and get whatever he wants. Yeah, that's my response yeah. to that. <laughs> <laughs> so good. And, so good. And, uh, and the bathroom later, right? So, um, all right. Uh, 
So five minutes left. I know we're not going to necessarily get into QA, but I wanted to make sure we got everyone's perspective of like how do you how do they start, right? Um, and you know, Alex, where let's just assume you're saying composable is the best, gives you the greatest scalability, flexibility. Um, you don't have to deal with uh, inverse con Conway's law where I gotta refactor my team to match what the, what the CD pack CDP does and doesn't. Um, uh, sorry, I'm um, not have been cutting out. Uh, where where do you, where do you recommend companies start? So for us, you first, they're taking public approach. I think I'll go back to what I said probably for three times today, but I, I, I like we are, it's about outcomes and it's about the humans, right? At the end of the day, like technology and the names, it's all a lot of jargon. And like, I think you, if you're a marketer and you're listening to this, like there is, I guarantee you, there is a data, there's a person whose title is data at your company who actually genuinely cares more about you than you realize and, and wants to enable you and like, go find them. And, then you can start talking about solutions together, like uh, before I show my product, right? And, 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 and honestly, I think there is, I have yet to meet a company, genuinely, I have yet to meet a company where there isn't valuable data sitting on the floor, to your point about cleaning up the piles, David. Like, I have yet to come across one where, you know, the biggest discovery I've had running this for, for the last four years is that, like, I keep talking about these unbelievably sophisticated things and then and then I find out that they don't have like the ability to message someone based on like whether they logged in in the last 30 days. Like you know, like unbelievably basic stuff. Like like it, it, it's and so just just build the beginning of any workload, tighten the yeah. loop between you and that side. your life will get better and and the number one reason people don't deploy a solution for us anyway, from my perspective, I don't know if it's the same for the other two, is is they think they're not ready. They think, I don't know, I don't I think my data is not ready. And I'm like, it is, there is no ready. There is only start. And there is only like, customer 360 is a process, is not an end state. It's a process. And tighten the loop, create a connection between those, and you will be able to iterate your way to greatness. Like, I, I, that's what I would say. That's how you start. I, I was going to say the same thing. I was going to say, take a, take a crawl, walk, run approach. And like, like if, if you're an airline that's sending like text messages about people needing to upload like vaccination certificates when they did it a day ago, right there, you've got that data in, uh, like, this is kind of front of mind for me, right there, you've got that data in your organization. You could, you could get that into an engagement platform and, and, and right there you've improved the customer experience. Cool walk run. Jason. I mean, look, I, I, I think both, you know, you know you're, you're not going to love this, David, but I, I, I think both what Boris and Alex said, you know, I, I agree with 100%. And look, ultimately, it's about, you know, success is, you know, success starts with bringing together both sides of the house, having a conversation around requirements. Um, you know, you, you know the, the problem with waiting for your you know, data strategy to make sure is that you don't have that North Star of use cases, which is pulling in the right direction. And suddenly, you know, it's fully matured, but it's built for the entirely wrong set of problems. Um, you know, which happens all too often, um, you know, but, you know, I, I really think, you know, the you know, step one for anyone listening, you know, in on this webinar uh, and, you know, asking what should their CDB strategy be, you know, is, is get on the horn, you know, with, you know, you know your, your counterparts on the other side of the business, uh, align on what needs to happen. Uh, you have a set of, um, you know, conversations that are holistic, um, you know, and then, um, you know, you, you, you have conversations together. Uh, Jason, I don't know why you think I would be upset that you agree with them. Uh, <laughs> I know this was this was meant to be a debate, but um, I also think that any any type of project or initiative, uh, it kind of doesn't matter what the technology is. It's always you, you all kind of need some key ingredients in terms of what you need to do. Um, so what I say, uh, in addition to what you all, all said, because I, I love the crawl, walk, run, is this idea of understand what your company is trying to do, um, like establish a vision statement or a vision or a North Star. It doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to exist on a piece of paper that people can refer to. Understand what are quote unquote value drivers. 
that, that drive that mission, whether it's increasing revenue, decreasing operational costs, building better experiences that are, that's measurable by, you know, NPS or CSAT, something like these drivers. <clears throat> Why that's important is because everyone talks about use cases, right? Uh, which will then help you uh, make decisions on what capabilities and, and technologies you need. But it also allows you to prioritize to your company, like, well, these drive these types of value from the value drivers you can map to. Um, and then th that's how you kind of start on your way of, okay, now I am able to prioritize a set of use cases and capabilities I need in a crawl, walk, run fashion. So um, I agree with all of you, Jason. <laughs> 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 all right. Um, well, I think we're at time. Uh, we were not able to get to Q&A, so I apologize, but I think we're going to find a way to collect all the questions and find a way to follow up with the with everyone. Uh, thank you so much, um, Alex, Jason, and Boris for your time today. Um, Thanks for moderating. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, Cheers, David. Yeah. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.